as I try to move all this around. But uh, first of all, I just want to take the time to thank everyone. I appreciate you so much for coming. And uh, it's good to see so many faces here that I haven't seen before. And, and the amazing part of this is uh, it all started with one person inviting another person to church. And, and we see that's the way God designed it to work. Well, during the Easter season, we sent out 5,000 postcards, and we had about two people come that we didn't recognize. <laughs> but, but a lady's working with another lady, and she invites her family and her to come to church, and then that lady invites another people, and, and all of a sudden... There's 12, 13 new people here. That's the way God's kingdom decided that it's supposed to work. Each of us talking to others and bringing them in here. And if you notice, if you've been here for a while, there's a couple new faces around here that are helping out with the worship team as well. So I want to thank uh, the other Rob. I really like that name. The other Rob. We'll call him Or. O R. <laughs> and Trish in the back helping with tech. And uh, so it, it's great. So be careful if you keep coming, we're going to give you a job around here. I just want you to know that. But the fact is, we never want to take you for granted either. We appreciate you coming out here, and we work really hard to try to do the best we can with the musicians and with the music and with the services so that uh, the time that you spent here is very well spent. So we appreciate you, and we want it to be a good investment. If you're going to spend an hour, hour and 15 minutes with us, we want to make sure that that time is well spent. Now, if you weren't here last week, it's great because uh, we started a new sermon series, and our new sermon series is called The Abundant Life, and it is designed to help people live like and live more abundantly. Now, the good news is if you weren't here last night or last week, every lesson stands on its own. So, you, so today's lesson, uh, you're not going to be lost. But we had a lot of uh, people talking about last week's lesson. In fact, we got more people talking about last week's lesson than we did most lessons. And if you missed that and you want to catch up, you can go right to our website at www.odyssey.com, as, as Jennifer said, or our YouTube channel, and you can watch it there. Or if you like today's message and you think somebody that you know is not living life the way they should, more abundantly, as Jesus said, that we should be living it, invite them to come and take a look at it as well. Uh, that is, unless you live in Germany. Because uh, my understanding is Germany has blocked some of our uh, YouTube videos. So uh, I think they're having this uh, crisis over there in the economy. So I think they're holding us hostage. They want us to pay ransom. We're not paying in. So uh, uh, they can watch most of our messages, but not all of it. But uh, Germany did uh, has blocked some of our messages. So in a way, I think we must be doing what we're supposed to be doing. So... <laughs> But here's what I believe. I believe we take the principles that we're teaching in this lesson, because they're not us teaching, they come from Scripture, so it's God teaching. If you take these principles and apply them to your life, you will live life and you will live it more abundantly, no matter how abundantly you're living right now or unabundantly that you're living right now. Jesus says in John 10.10 10, that the thief's purpose is to come to steal and kill and destroy. And we know that's true because Satan attacks each one of us. Satan comes high, he kills our relationship, he, he steals our finances, he destroys things around us, our health sometimes, some other things. And I thank God because all those things have affected me at one point in my life. I, I've had relationships destroyed, I've had finances that have been killed, I've, I've had my health at times that looked like it was going to be uh, stolen from me. I thank God he doesn't leave it there. He goes on to say that Jesus said, my purpose, the reason I came, is so that according to the NLT, and if you don't have a Bible with you today, the words are going to be on the screen for the most part. Uh, we have some Bibles over here. Please take one with you when you come, when you leave. They're free. They're our gift to you. Uh, we don't want you to live off my revelation or somebody else's revelation. We want God to give you your own revelation as you leave here. But the NLT says the thief's purpose is come, steal, and destroy my purpose, according to Jesus, that my purpose, he says, is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Or as a new international version, I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. And that's where we get the name of our sermon series is, because if we're going to live the more abundant life, we have to live it based on what God tells us to do. And as we heard last week, the Apostle Paul, he, he writes to his protege, uh, Timothy. Now, the Apostle Paul, if you've been here for a while, we've talked a lot about him. He was uh, a guy who had a revelation of Jesus Christ after Jesus Christ was dead and raised from the dead. So that's sort of weird, but that's what happened. And Paul believed this to such an extent that he, he was willing to die for it. In fact, he was killed or martyred for his faith. But in late in his life, probably the last letter he wrote, he wrote to his friend Timothy, and he's sort of handing the torch off to Timothy. He sort of become Timothy is the person that's going to take Paul's life, his protege. 
And, and, and he tells Timothy, and one of my favorite translations of these particular verses are found in a translation called the, the Message Translation. Very simple, easy to read translation. A little loose sometimes, that's why I don't preach from it. But what it says is every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion. Anytime we sin against God, we're rebelling against Him, correcting Him our mistakes, training us to live in God's way. Through the Word, we are put together and shaped up for the task that God gives us. We are put together and shaped up. God gives us His Word, and it will show us the truth. It will expose our rebellion. And one way or another, it will uh, shape us and, and make us into what God wants us to be if we apply it to our life so we can do the task that God has designed us to do. Training us to live God's way. So every part of Scripture, we believe, is, the word there is God breathed. Some translations use inspire, but that word, Greek word inspired actually means God breathed. He uses man's uh, personality, man's experiences, but he actually breathes the words himself. And whether you believe Jesus is who he says you're not, if you're not quite convinced yet that Jesus is who he says he is, we ask you to come and follow. That's all Jesus ever asked to do. Come and follow and see if I'm not who I say I am. But if you're not quite there, what you know in your own heart, what I know in my own heart, if we apply the words of Scripture to our life, we will live more abundantly. Whether we believe in Jesus or not. Now, the key verse, as I said from this series, is found in the last part of the Gospel of uh, John, chapter 10. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. So we've been praying and we've been hoping that you'll take this Word of God home with you and that you'll apply it to your life so that you may be put together, so that you may be shaped up for the task that God has for you, so you may live God's way, and God's way is that you live the more abundant life that Jesus promised us we could have and His Word promised you that you could have in His Word. But here's the fact, you know, I look around all the time, and not just people in our church, but in my family and my friends and the people in this community, and I, I see so many people aren't living the more abundant life. There's so many people that I know personally that aren't living a, a life of abundance at all. Some of them, you know, quite frankly, some of the people that I know are, are having a hard time just living life, let alone living it more abundantly. So... The question, maybe it should be, not how to have the more abundant life, but you know, how do we live it? You know, we, we know what the Word says. How do we live it so we can live life and live it more abundantly? And again, I believe that the answers to this are found in Scripture. So what we do is we, we take a subject and like uh, the more abundant life, and, and we talk about it several weeks because you can't learn it in one week. And what you repeat, you remember. And, and we give you the steps. So instead of giving you all the steps in one section, we want you to know each step carefully. So for the next several weeks, we're going on how to have this more abundant life. And if you study the Bible, this is what you know about the Bible. We already know that God is a God who loves us. God is a God of renewal. God is a God of restoration. God is a God of rejuvenation. God is a God that uh, gives us new passion. God is a God that decides that He wants to do new things in our life all the time. But last week, and I'm not going to review every week, but there's a lot of people here that weren't here last week. So last week, what we said was, sometimes we got to get to the starting point. Sometimes we, we just got to find the starting line. And in order to find the starting line, we've got to go back and get rid of some of the things in the past. In Isaiah 43, it says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. So the first step in having this abundant life that Jesus has promised that we can have is to get rid of some of the things from our past which are holding us from getting this new thing. So we came up with a word or an acrostic that helps us forget the former things. So the first thing we said we have to do is we have to take inventory. You know, uh, we talk about how a, a car has, has a windshield and it also has a rear view mirror. And the windshield is much bigger than the rear view mirror because we're to look forward more than we're looking behind. The behind, the, behind, the rear view, it is a great tool. Uh, it can help us see some things we've done right in our life and maybe uh, repeat those things. It can see some of the things that we've done wrong in our life so that we don't repeat those things. But the fact is, and I know so many people like this, is they're driving with the rear view mirror, not the windshield. They're going backwards instead of forwards. And sooner or later, if you keep going backwards, your life will crash. And we know people like that. We know people who are trying to live in the past. The past is a great tool, but we don't worship the past. 
But these people, they've been in the past, and all of a sudden their life's are wrecked, and they don't understand why. So we need to take inventory. After we see what was useful and what isn't useful, what do we have left? If our, if our finances have been destroyed, what finances do we have left? If our relationships have been killed, what relationships have, have, do we have left? If our health is destroyed, what part of our health can we use to live this purposeful life? Then we take those things and, and we refocus our thoughts. And we don't refocus our thoughts by trying to forget our thoughts. That's never worked. We have to replace our thoughts. So we take God's word, scripture, because I can't find anything else to replace my thinking thinking with then God's word. We take God's word and we replace our negative thoughts with positive thoughts. So we, we take out the trash, so, so to speak, the T-R-A-S-H. We take inventory of what we have left. We refocus, we place the thoughts that we have that are negative, and then we have to act in faith, as Jennifer said. We have to act in faith that God will do what he says he's going to do. Now, if you look at my phone, I, I, I've got a, a phone that I can bring up pictures from. I took a picture uh, of a sheet of God's promise that he has a plan and a purpose for my life. Not to hurt me, not to harm me, but to help me. God promised me that he loves me. God promised me that I can do all things through him. And I keep repeating these things to myself, refocusing my thoughts, and I'm acting in faith that God's going to commit those promises that he's already said he would. We know our God's a God that keeps his word. So I know that he's going to do that. But sometimes I can't see it, so I have to act in faith. And then, you know, that's, that's the one that, that I think we're all guilty of. we got to stop making excuses, don't Amen. we? we got to stop feeling sorry for ourselves. we got to stop uh, having pity parties. we got to move forward. we got to stop making excuses. we got to stop blaming everybody else. And then the last one is simply we have to have trust in God. We just have to know God's going to do what he said he's going to do. But sometimes we get to that point and, we, and, and we've sort of forgotten the past, but where do we start? You know, where is the starting line? Where, what do we do now after we've forgotten these former things, after we aren't dwelling in the past, after we, you know, we've taken inventory of what we have? And what is the starting line? So I, I think the second component, the second key to having a more abundant life, is finding that starting point, and you find that starting point by trying to discover what your purpose is. Why were you put here? Where are you going? What's our purpose? Now, I don't know, some of you may know, uh, remember Yogi, uh, Bear, Yogi Bear, and he's still alive today, he's 89, I think, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, he was a American League player, a baseball coach, a baseball manager, and, and, and the strange part about it is he's not really remembered for being the baseball guy. He's remembered for the quotes he had. They called him yogiisms because he came up with all these crazy stuff. Uh, one time he says, you know, the best thing in the world is looking towards for heaven. Well, baseball's pretty good, too. One of the other ones that I like, and this is what we're looking at today, is if you don't know where you're going, you're probably going to end up someplace. I like the way another pastor put it, though. He said, everybody ends up somewhere. Shouldn't you end up somewhere on purpose? Amen. All right? So I believe the second key for the more abundant life is we have to have a definitive purpose. We have to have a purpose that we can define. We have to know who we are and where we're going. So last week, we pointed out, like I said, that the car has this rear view mirror and a windshield. We have to see how we're going forward. So the second key to the abundant life is to know where we're going, to know your purpose. And your purpose must be definitive. You must be able to define your purpose. Now, if you take a study and you study people that are successful, people that have had any kind of lasting success, what you're going to see is each one of them knew their purpose. They had a plan to fulfill their purpose. Each one devoted a great deal of their time, of their thoughts, of their efforts to make sure they arrived at the place they wanted to go. They knew where they were headed, and they had a plan how to get there. So the question you have to ask yourself this morning, what's my purpose? You know, why am I here? Because if you don't know that, it, it's hard to get somewhere. And you're going to end up somewhere. Wouldn't it be better to end up somewhere on purpose? And if I believe, if I truly believe that I am created by God, and I'm created by God who loves me so much that he created me, shaped me, formed me in his image, I have to believe that he created me for a purpose. So what is my purpose? Why did God create me? Was it for me or was it for him? And I believe that the answer is pretty simple. Because if you think of anybody who's ever created anything, they never created for the creation. 
If I'm going to create something, I create it for my pleasure and somebody else's use. My pleasure or somebody else's pleasure. You know, a guy who creates a hybrid flower, it's very beautiful. He doesn't create it for the flower. He creates it for his joy, his pleasure, and for other people to see. You don't create something for the sake of creation, but for the I mean, you create something for the sake of others or for yourself. So the reason that I believe we're created is for God and for his purposes. And there's a difference between a definitive purpose and a wish. Everybody wishes to have a more abundant life. I've never met one person in my entire life that says, you know what, God has blessed me too much. My health is too good. My marriage is, I wish he would take some of this stuff away. It is just too good. Never met one person like that. But most people wish their life was better, but they don't have a plan or a purpose to make their life better. Okay. If you know what it is you want to point, if you know what direction you want to go, if you know what your purpose is, if it becomes something you put your thoughts into, you, you back that focus, and you back those thoughts with actions and a plan, then you're going to awaken the purpose for your life. And you'll begin to know where you're headed. You'll begin to know where you're going. But this is the stumbling block for most people because they never define their purpose and they never develop a plan or a set goal or even start to follow what it is that they want. They're like somebody who got in a car with a full tank of gas and just started to drive in no particular direction. They don't know where they're going, so they don't know if they ever get there. And sometimes when you do that, you end up some places that you shouldn't be in. God has given each one of us. He's given us different talents. He's given us different resources. And once we harness those talents, once we harness those resources, we can use them for God's glory, our good, and the service of others. A definitive purpose for our life helps us to focus and to gain knowledge to become better at whatever God has given us to do. So we have to determine what our purpose is. And if you get any of the self-help books, if you watch any of the motivational speakers on TV, they're, they're going to they're gonna tell you. That's what they're going to teach you. You can't be successful in any area of your life until you know where you're headed. You have to know where you're going or you're likely to get all off and end up someplace that's worse than you are right now. At the very best, you can hope is to turn around and go in circles and come back right where you are. It's been said, one, one quote that I like is, life without a purpose is like a dull pencil. Doesn't have a point. And I think most of the time, the reason we don't find purpose, the reason we lack contentment, the reason we don't live the more abundant life is we start looking in the wrong place. We start looking at ourselves. Amen. We start where the world tells us to start. What should I do with my life? What should I do about my goals? What are my ambitions? What are my dreams? What are my future? And these things are very, very important. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But that's not where we need to start. The first thing we need to do is remind ourselves it's not about us. What did Paul tell Timothy? Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the task God has for us. It's not about us. It's about God and His glory. It's about the one who put you together and shaped you. It's about your Creator. If all we do is focus on ourselves, we're never going to find out what the real purpose of our lives is. In Proverbs 16, 4, and I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Version. The Amplified Version takes a verse and does exactly what it says. It amplifies it. The Lord has made everything... The Lord has made everything to accommodate itself and contribute to its own end and his own purpose. In other words, he created us for a purpose. We have an end purpose, and it's for God's glory. Everything is made by God, for God, and for his purpose and for his glory. We're made by God, and by God, he, he uses us for his purpose and his glory and not the other way around. So often in this world, we try to do it the other way around. We're not we're not to use God for our purposes and for our glory. We're to let God use us for his purposes. If we want to know the purpose we're created for, we have to ask our creator. See, here's a fact. God was thinking of you long before you ever began thinking about him. Psalm 139, 16 reminds us that God saw us before we were even born. He formed us. He made us in our mother's womb. He scheduled each day and every day of our lives before we even began to breathe. 
Isaiah 44, 2, and I'm quoting from the New International Version of the Bible. The prophet, he makes this claim. This is what the Lord says. He who has made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. The Lord made you, the Lord formed you, and the Lord will help you. And if we want to know what our purpose is, then we need to turn to Scripture so the one who made us can tell us what he made us for. To determine our purpose, we have to start with God and not with our source. In order to discover our purpose, in order for us to know where we're going, and to reach our fullest potential, we need to turn to the Word of God to help us understand His original plans for our life. In Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians, Ephesus was a town, and uh, Paul writes a letter to the Ephesians who lived there, and it's translated from the Greek in the Amplified Version again like this. For we are God's own handiwork. We are made by God. It's His own handiwork. His workmanship, recreated in Jesus Christ, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined before, uh, planned beforehand for us taking paths which He prepared ahead of time. He made us beforehand. He prepared ahead of time for our purpose. We should walk in them living the good life. In other words, living the more abundant life which he prearranged, he's already made the arrangements for it, and made ready for us. Not only has he made the arrangements, he's made it ready for it. The question is, are we going to take it? It's there. Do you see it? And, and the person who the Holy Spirit is using to pen these words, to write these words, is the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul knew his purpose, and he had a plan to fulfill his purpose, and he devoted all of his thoughts and all of his talents and all of his efforts and all of his time in order to make sure he fulfilled the purpose that God has for his life. Amen. And I think most people who know anything about Paul would say he pretty much accomplished that. Mm -hmm. We're still reaping the rewards of Paul's purpose and Paul's plan even today, 2,000 years later. Now, if you're here, I'm going to do something. And I, I, I really, with so many guests here, sometimes I'm thinking this is the wisest thing, but... I'm going to do something they tell you don't do in Bible school and don't do in seminary. Usually you take a section of scripture and you expose it or expository or, and you talk about it and you come to the main idea. But our, I think to find our purpose we have to go a little bit bigger than that. Uh, we're going to look at and concentrate on the life of Paul through his writings. So I'm going to sort of be all over the place. So what I did was I made a list of the scriptures and put them in your bulletin. So that if you wanted to study them afterwards, if you wanted to study them as we went along, they were there for you. If you didn't get a bulletin, you didn't get that, just see me after service, I'll make sure you get one. But all the, not all the verses, but the majority of the verses, at least the ones of Paul's, are on that uh, little white piece of paper in your, in your um, bulletins this morning. And I know there's a lot of stuff in there. That's my fault because I was just too lazy to take everything out from last week that was left over. So forgive me. But Paul was writing to the people in Philippi, so with the letter we call Philippians. And he was actually, if you, if you think about this, this is pretty amazing, because Paul's writing this letter as he's sitting in jail. And Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 says this, Dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. What Paul is saying is, I haven't got there yet, but I know where I'm going. I haven't achieved it yet, but I know what my purpose is, and that's all I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on the one thing that God has given me to do. Forgetting the past. See, Paul already knew last week's lesson. He probably watched it at, on our website. But Paul already knew last week's lesson. He said, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. He said, I perceive it. I see it. I'm straining towards it. What's ahead? I'm going ahead because I know God wants to do a new thing in my life. And when he concentrated and knew his focus, he knew he hadn't achieved it yet, but he forgot the past. He's looking for it. And he said, nothing going to let me stop from getting there. In other words, Paul said, I know my purpose. And my purpose is to glorify God in everything I do, and nothing in my past is going to keep me from getting this new thing God wants me to have. Nothing is going to keep me from fulfilling my purpose and getting this new thing that God has for my life. I'm pressing forward. I'm looking ahead to the prize. I'm not looking towards the past. If you don't know your purpose, if you don't know your purpose of your life, then you don't know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, you just might end up somewhere else. And I think that's why so many people think life is pointless and useless and repetitive and they feel unfulfilled and insignificant. Right. Now here's a fact. Most people don't realize this. Here's a fact. Happy people and unhappy people have basically the same life experiences. 
Happy people and unhappy people have basically the same life experiences. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, what has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. But here's what research tells us. Even though we have the same experiences, the difference is unhappy people spend twice as much time thinking about all that's wrong in their lives while happy people know their purpose. Amen. They seek out and they rely upon the information which will brighten their personal outlook and therefore they help themselves to actually light up and brighten their personal outlook. And therefore they are living the more abundant life that God desires for them to live. Amen. Very good. So the, the thing is, it's, it's what we think about is what we become. If you spend twice as much time thinking about everything that's wrong in your life, you're not going to be as happy as the person who's thinking about their purpose and where they're headed in life. And there was anybody, if there was anybody that could look at their past and say, you know, my past is horrible and feel sorry for themselves, it was Paul himself. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I have served him far more, I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been with times without number, and faced death again and again, five different times, the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Wow. Three times I was shipwrecked. I once spent a whole night and a day adrift at the sea. I had traveled on many long journeys. I had faced danger from rivers and robbers. I had faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. I had faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and in the seas. I had faced danger from men who claimed to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry. I have been thirsty. I have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my feeling that weak? And who is led astray and I do not burn with anger? To sort of put this in context, what Paul is saying is I don't know what you're facing in your life. He said, but if you're facing some things in your life and you think maybe you're a prisoner of the circumstances or life is beating you up or whether you keep having health problems or the people you thought were your friends have turned against you and are talking bad about you or maybe even they slandered your name, told lies about you and they cost you something that you knew was very important to you. They cost you your job or your marriage or your respect of your kids, respect of your loved ones. If you're constantly in trouble for your beliefs, you stay up at night because you can't sleep because of all the problems in your life. Your, your circumstances have changed. You used to be rich and now you're poor. Even necessities of life like food and clothes and shelter are hard to come by. And you have people that you love that have turned against you. And on top of all that, you have people you love you worry about their problems as well. Paul says if you don't have one of these problems, but you have all of these problems, he says, welcome to my world. I don't think any of us have all the problems that Paul had. But Paul says it doesn't matter. I forgot about those things in the past. I'm not going to dwell on them anymore. God wants to do a new thing in my life. And when you discover what your purpose is, when you discover why you were created, none of those other things are going to matter to you anymore. And Paul knows there's a difference between being successful in the world's eyes and fulfilling the purpose which God has given you and being successful in His eyes. Again, he writes to Philippians chapter 3, and he says, Once I thought these things were valuable. All of these things. Paul, Paul was a man who had great wealth. Paul was a man who had great power and prestige and all these other things, and he gave it all up for Jesus. And Paul said, I thought these things were valuable. I thought these things that made me successful, my accomplishment, the pleasures of my life, my power, my position, my riches, my security, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else, all those other things are worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. He said, I was created by God, I was created for God, I was created for His purpose and His glory, and He said, what's more? For His sake, I discarded everything else Counting it as garbage. I took the trash out because I knew my purpose. It's not about me. It's about God. My purpose is so that I could gain Christ and become one with Him and no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through the faith of Christ. God's way is making us right with Himself 
depends on faith. You may not see it right now. He goes, I know my purpose. I wasn't created for myself. My purpose is for God and his purpose is in his glory. And I don't have to focus on myself anymore because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. That's what we want for the people who come to the Odyssey Church. We want you to know Christ and experience the mighty power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You can have in your life and you can live life more abundantly. Amen. I want to suffer with him sharing in his death so that one way or another I'll experience the resurrection of the dead. See, Paul had everything at one time. He had everything the world had to offer. Money and power, respect and position. But he realized that things of this world weren't going to last. The one who dies with the most toys is dead dead. That's right. He said, I'm working for something more. I'm working for something that goes beyond this world. He wrote to his friend Timothy and he said, For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. See, sometimes we, 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 we think those things are made up by people in the world. This, most of the sayings we have are made up by Scripture. Paul, in his writings, inspired by that Holy Spirit, tells us over and over again, we have a perfect God's masterpiece. He writes to the people and actually says, you are something special. You're not just created by God. You're not just created for God. You are His masterpiece. When you look in the mirror you're looking at God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things He planned for us to do. In other words, all these goals and all these things we have in our life are important, but we were created for a purpose. And until you figure that purpose out, you're never going to truly be content. We have a destiny. You weren't just created. You were created as God's masterpiece. The Bible says we're the crown of His glory. He has plans for your life from long, long ago. He's known you longer than you've known Him. And His plans for your life is to do good things through Jesus Christ. So you have to ask yourself, what is my purpose? Why am I here? What has God created me to do? And we can know where we're going, but we have to know it doesn't center around us. In fact, it doesn't even center around our families. And it doesn't center around our needs. And it doesn't center around our personal fulfillment. It centers around Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that we don't take care of our families. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of our needs. I'm not saying that either. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have dreams for the future. We should have dreams for the future. What I'm saying, as good as those things are, as worthy of all that is, it shouldn't be what motivates us. It shouldn't be our purpose in our life. If it's our goals and our dreams and our, pur our, our purpose... It's just simply not big enough. Amen. We were designed and created for God, and we need to let God do a new thing in our lives, and we serve a great, big, awesome God, so we should let Him do great, big, awesome things in our lives. Our goal should be the same as Paul's. It means that I take care of my family because I've centered myself around Jesus. It means that I have dreams for the future because I've centered myself around Jesus. The reason I live more abundantly is I've centered my life and my purpose around Jesus and His glory. Do you know where you're going? Do you know what your purpose is? And if you don't, it's okay because you wouldn't be the first person to ask that question. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. In Jeremiah 20, 18, the prophet asked, why was I ever born? He's talking to God. He goes, God, why was I ever born? My entire life has been nothing but filled with trouble and sorrow and shame. There's probably people right here today that can relate to Jeremiah. They feel like, why was I born? And my life has been nothing but trouble. I, and my whole life has been full of sorrow. It's been full of shame. And it seems like when you get one problem solved, two more come along. I want you to know this. I want you to understand this. Now, when you get this in your mind, when you move from here and then get it in your heart, it'll change your life. God put you here for a reason. God put you here because He loves you. God put you here because you're created in His image and He has a purpose for your life. You're not just drifting. Your purpose is to, to glorify Him. 
Your purpose is for His glory. And when you begin to see that, you're right. You'll begin to see it from a different perspective. And when you do, you'll start to see where you're going and what your purpose is. You'll begin to understand the purpose and the direction your life should be going in. And you're not going to end up somewhere. You're going to end up somewhere else. You're not going to end up in a place that you shouldn't be. You'll end up somewhere on purpose. And ending up on a place on purpose makes a lot more sense than just drifting through life and ending up somewhere. Amen. Now for those of you who maybe you, you don't believe in God yet or, 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 or you're not quite sure if God is who He said He is. You're not quite sure Jesus is who He said. You know, if you never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you may or may not become successful. You may become successful. I know a lot of atheist people who are successful, but they'll never answer the reason as to why they're here. You'll never know what your true purpose is, and therefore you can never be truly content. Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us that God has set eternity in our hearts. Really, isn't that why we come to church? Because we have eternity in our hearts. We want to know there's a place better than this after here. But he said it's not just about that. It's about living life now, living it more abundantly. And until we start looking towards eternity and not the 60 or 70 or 80 or sometimes 90 years we get here on life, we can never fulfill our purpose. We can never accomplish what it is that God has set the task for our life, what he created us to do. God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and He wants you to see that, and He wants you to see that last all the way into eternity. The first step to knowing your person, your purpose is to know the one who created you for His purpose. The first step to knowing your purpose is to establish a relationship with the living God, with the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is God, the one who gives you your purpose. We're not to wander aimlessly through life. Do you know where you're going? Do you know what your purpose is? And we ask and we don't know, and fortunately, God gives us his love letter. He gives us an instruction book in the form of what we call the Bible. Paul writes to his friend Timothy. He said, God saved us and called us to live a holy life. We're called to live a holy life. We're called to live for God and live for Jesus, who calls you for the purpose of a holy life, and not your glory, but his glory. He did this. Not because we deserved it. We haven't done anything to deserve it. He did it because he's a loving God, and that was his plan before the beginning of time, to show us this grace through Jesus Christ. God loves us so much. It was his plan from the beginning. Sometimes we just drift through life and we don't pay attention. God loved you before you were born, and he had a plan for your life because of that love. And because of his grace, we get what we don't deserve. And he made all of this his pain to us by appearing of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ came on the scene, everything that was prophesied was proven. Jesus Christ, our Savior, he broke the power of death. And he illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. Paul reminds us that Christ came with a purpose. He came to save us. He broke the power of death. He illuminated the way to life and immortality. Now that's a purpose for your life. He knew his purpose. And God gives us the life of Paul. So according to Paul, inspired by God himself, he, Paul says, God created me for a purpose. And he goes, I wrote all this so you can hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you have learned from me. Paul says, this is written down, saved on ancient documents for 2,000 years so that you can follow this pattern that I'm teaching you, a pattern shaped by faith, a pattern shaped by love that you have in Jesus Christ. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, the same power who raised Jesus Christ from the dead carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. God said, I've entrusted you with something, and it's precious. Paul says, follow my example. Hold on to the pattern of this teaching. It's a new thing for some of you, and I know that. You may not see it at first. You may not get it first. You have to look for it, but do you feel it inside of you? It's a life of purpose shaped by faith and in love in Jesus Christ. Guard it carefully, because God has trust you with the most precious to him. The truth of the good news of the gospel, salvation through Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit which lives in you, so you can have life and have it more abundantly. When you put your faith and trust and believe, Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he is. And the Holy Spirit calls us to remember what Paul's purpose was, and what our purpose is, not for our glory, but for his glory. Mm. And he gave us a physical picture God gives us many physical pictures in his scriptures of spiritual truth. And one of those he gave us is Paul's life. But I believe the greatest picture he gave us was the life of Jesus. 
The greatest example of what you can accomplish when you know what your purpose is is found in Jesus Christ himself. Because when you know what your purpose is, you don't get sidetracked. You won't let circumstances, you won't let the distractions of this world, you won't let the temptation of this world, the promises of this world, you won't let anything, even the devil himself, keep you from fulfilling your purpose. Amen. Maybe, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. You know, uh, maybe you remember from the scriptures when you were in Bible school, you remember the account of the devil trying to tempt Jesus in the desert. You know, the devil comes after Jesus physically, and emotionally, and spiritually, but Jesus knew his purpose, and he kept his eyes on the prize. Well, let me tell you who the prize was. It was you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and everybody in him. We are the prize of Jesus. He kept his eyes on us, and he didn't have to cave into temptation. He gives us an example of a parent to follow so we can keep our eyes on the prize and not cave into temptation ourselves to live the more abundant life, a life with purpose. And Jesus didn't do this once, and he didn't do it twice, he didn't do it three times, he did it his entire life, all the way up to his execution. On the night before he would be arrested and convicted in a mock court and be crucified, Jesus prayed to his heavenly Father, and it's recorded us by one of his closest friends, John, saved down through the centuries on ancient documents for us to read today. And John records, after saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so he can give glory back to you. Now, if Jesus came to glorify God, how much more are we supposed to glorify God? For you have been given authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one of you that you have given him, and this is the way to have eternal life. He spells it out very, this is how you have eternal life. To know the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. He says, the way to have eternal life is to know God and know Jesus. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing, by fulfilling my purpose. Give it, I fulfilled the job he gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me glory. Bring me into glory that we shared before the world began. Jesus said, I knew my purpose. And he asked us to remember what it cost him. And he shows us that no matter what happens to us, no matter what we go through, if we keep our eyes on our purpose, we can get through it. To glorify God, the same purpose, the same as Jesus. Our, that's our job. That's our purpose. To glorify the God, the Father, by putting our faith in God the Son, by the power of God the Holy Spirit. Do you know the one true God? Do you know Jesus Christ and the one he sent to earth? Will you complete the work you put together, that you were put together and shaped for, for the task that God has assigned you? Do you know what your purpose is? And your purpose is to glorify God and knowing the purpose for your life frees your mind. Here's what it does. It frees your mind so that you can have faith. It frees your mind from the limitations of discouragement and procrastination and indecision. Knowing your purpose is how you live life and live it more abundantly. Amen. See, when I get discouraged, I don't have to give up because I know what my purpose is. When things come against me, I don't have to give up because I know what my purpose is. Now, I don't, re I don't know, we're getting ready to close, so I, I don't know if you remember when you were in school, at, at the end of the, the day, most of the time they would give you homework. Guess what I'm going to do today? When the class was over, the teacher would give you homework, so you make sure you knew the lesson and help you remember it. So that's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to try to help you out. I want you take that little green card home with you. I want you to think about it. Not just spell it out. Blankly, but think about it and try to determine if you don't know already what your purpose is, why God created you and what he created you to do. And you ask yourself, what is my purpose? And now I know my purpose is to glorify God and I know Paul gives me a pattern of his life to follow and Jesus shows me how when I know my purpose I can handle anything which comes my way, but what is my unique task God has planned for me in my life? And if you're brave, if you're brave and you want to, you can bring it back next week and let me share it with some people. Now I won't I won't embarrass you, I won't tell you who did it, but it would be pretty cool to have a couple different uh, takes on what people think that their purpose is. And so you can have an example so that you know that I don't ask you to do anything that I don't do, or don't ask myself to do. I believe my purpose, and I believe this is the reason of my purpose. My purpose is to make a difference in the lives of God's children and their families through a spirit of excellence. That's why I work so hard at what I do. That's why we try to help as many people as I can. That's why we try to do the things that God has created, because I want to make a difference in the lives of God's children and their families 
and I want to do it through a spirit of excellence. And if something comes along and it doesn't line up with what my purpose is, it's easy for me to say no. If something comes along and the devil tempts me physically, emotionally, or spiritually, I don't have to cave in because I know what my purpose is. And if I get tired and I get discouraged, I don't have to give up because I know what my purpose is. That's right. I'm trying to follow Paul's pattern. I'm trying to follow the example of Jesus because I don't want to end up somewhere. I want to end up somewhere on purpose. And that's what I want for all of you. Because when you put your past behind you, and you see this new thing that God wants for you to do in your life, and you know God has a plan for your life, and you see how much God loves you, and you know that this happened a long, long time ago, He created you for a purpose and for a reason, then you can live life, and you can live it more abundantly. And it all begins with the simple step of faith. It all begins by putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, by accepting Him, both your Lord and your Savior. And today's a day you like to do that. There's a card in your bulletins. I tried to put them behind the seats, but they fell in and nobody could ever get them out, so I put them in your bulletin. <laughs> Today's the day you want to make that next commitment to Jesus Christ. Please just fill that card out, and you can drop it in the basket or you can give it to somebody that you've seen up here on stage. And then we'll be trying to get you some information, even though I promised at Easter time, I've been working on people getting at home. I promise you I will be more diligent about that. And we ask you don't forget to come back next week as we continue this year because one lesson does build upon the other. Once you've forgotten your past, you put it behind you, and you know what your purpose is, you sort of have to know what direction to go into, don't you? So that's what we're going to be exploring next week. We're going to ask the question, what is the direction of our life? What is the direction the life should be? So come back next Sunday. Do what this family has done. And bring somebody back with you. If you need a prayer or you need to accept Jesus Christ or you would like to have communion. Now, communion is a way that God gives us to remember Him by. We get the bread and we get the, the juice. The bread represents His body. The juice represents His blood. And dip it in the bread and take communion to help you remember what Jesus has done for you. Just, I'll be in the prayer room by the front door. Just please come in and see me. And I ask you, may the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be among you and within you wherever you find yourself this week. Try to end up somewhere on purpose, even this week. God bless you and thank you.